Hi everybody, thanks a lot for uh, joining us for today's conference and we are now um, delighted to move on to our keynote address to wrap up today's proceedings and we're very lucky this afternoon to be joined by Kwaku Adeboli, the former UBS trader who has, a very, has had a very interesting career and I'm sure he's going to share um, a bit of that with us today. Um, having uh, worked at UBS and uh, been the centre of a rogue trading scandal, he now um, has kindly committed his time to speaking about his challenge, the legal battle he's gone through, and he's going to be sharing some of his thoughts on where he thinks the banking industry is going today and what could be done better. So uh, without delaying proceedings any further, delighted to welcome Kwaku Adiboli. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I know it's been a long day. Um, thank you all for coming, and it's a real honor to be asked to come and speak in this venerated hall. Um, because it's been a long day, um, uh, and it's a sort of selfish aim of mine to make sure you're all awake, I was wondering, can you all stand up, please? <laughs> and I know you're going to hate me, but the whole world hates me. So can you find um, someone across the room and make eye contact with someone, just someone? Hold that eye contact. Uh, and I'm really sorry, but can you now swap places with that person? Swap places with that person. Makes me feel good to have the power to make people do stuff they don't want to do for once. Um, thank you very much um, for coming to this day. I hope um, it's been um, insightful in that your learning today has been very much both about the future of the finance industry but also the impact it's having on society today um, with the instability we see around the world. Um, I want, I've been asked to come and speak about the future of the finance industry and to base that in my experiences of the last sort of 13 years. And so in order obviously to do that, I need to go back in, in time. So I've got a little bit of a story to tell you, basically. Um, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, I was in probably the same position as you are today, um, full of idealism and hope for my future, looking forward to a life in which I could contribute to some of the direction of the world and to try and put my stamp on the way the world would move forward. Um, as young people, we are taught and inspired that uh, we have a role to play in our societies, and I certainly wanted to achieve that too. Back then, in the same way that um, uh, technology, social media, um, uh, startups today rule the world, back then, in 2002, it was the investment banks that ruled the world. Uh, I had studied computer science and management at Nottingham University and wanted actually to go into technology and management consulting, but um, unfortunately at the end of the last dot-com bust, that wasn't an option. Um, so applying for internships that year, I ended up applying to work at UBS. I did my internship in the summer of 2002. I'd chosen to work in operations because I thought that that was the best place to be to learn something of how um, corporations work um, so that in the following year I could go back to what I wanted to do, which was technology consulting. Now, the interesting thing is that when I got to UBS, the project I was asked to do left me with this sense that UBS was an institution that was formed through collegiate goals and in a familial way with common purpose driving through all that it was doing. It was a rapidly grow, grow, growing institution, much like all the investment banks. And we truly believed that as an institution, the best way forward was for us to have this idea that everyone had a common purpose and to work towards 
collegiate goals. Now, I, of course, um, was given a project where I was exposed to people across the institution globally, um, where I was asked to build a tool that would calculate the assets under management for the entire institution. And to do that, obviously, I had to speak to traders, senior people, operations staff, risk managers, etc., from across the globe. And as a lowly intern, I thought it was incredible that in an institution would give me that type of opportunity. And when I was offered a job at the end of that 10 weeks in the summer of 2002, I was truly, truly moved to become a part of UBS as a family the way that I saw it. I started work in 2003 full-time, um, obviously in operations, and my job was basically to handle exceptions in the settlements department. I tried as best I could to contribute something of value, um, and the way I thought I could do that was by recognizing patterns in the way things broke in the institution, and to help other people to fix that pattern so that they would make their own lives easier, and we would remove failures for good. Because of that, and because of the way I approached my work, I was given multiple opportunities to grow. They sent me to Stockholm after 10 months. They sent me to Hong Kong after 15 months. I worked hard, and I paid a high personal price for that. But I was given so many opportunities to grow. And to be fair, back in 2005 and 2006, as a 25-year-old, it was incredible to be given these opportunities. And then I was asked to become a junior trader. And I was not, I'd never set out to work in finance. I knew nothing of the finance world at all. I didn't know what finance's place in society was. I mean, now I think everyone does, actually, because finance plays such a big role in the way our world works. But back then, I just didn't know what investment banking was. But I was asked to become a junior trader, and there was a big moral question when that opportunity was given to me. I spent a lot of time with my mentors because I felt that having been allowed all that opportunity in operations, that I owed something to the mentors who had given me those, oppor those opportunities. So we spent a good four or five weeks discussing whether or not I should move into trading or stay in operations, where I was being groomed to be a leader in the institution. In the end, the decision was made that because of the range of experiences I'd had in the lead up to that, that point um, and the need in the business, the right thing to do, the moral thing to do would be to become a trader, to use the skills that they'd given me to further the institution's goals. So I became a junior trader in hedge fund services and amazingly, literally three months later, I was then asked to move from hedge fund services onto the ETF and index desk because, again, of the range of opportunities and experiences I'd had, which strangely and uniquely were perfectly suited to being an ETF and index trader on a desk that was growing incredibly rapidly at the time. I joined that desk in 2006. There were two traders already there. And what I found was a desk that was right at the center of everything the bank was doing. Right? Its profits were paid out to three different parts of the bank, to cash equities, to derivatives, and to the prime brokerage business. So a lot of people required and relied on that business for their growth and their profits. The problem was it was a new business area, growing rapidly, technology was evolving, and there was a lot of pressure on the book. And actually, the book had grown from about $200 million in terms of the amount of the bank's money that it used to $50 billion in the space of two or three years. So rapid, rapid growth. Then in 2007, while queues were forming outside Northern Rock, my boss left. He had built the book, and he'd been a trader for five years. And he left myself and a guy who was slightly more senior than me um, to run the book um, on our own. Between us, we had 30 months' experience, and we were running a $50 billion book equivalent to the GDP of Ghana, the country where I was born. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, when you think about that properly and the complexity involved in running a country, and you think about what that complexity must be replicated in a book of that size, I look back now and I wonder why we were allowed 
and given the responsibility to run such a big book. Nevertheless, going into the global financial crisis, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, with more systemic volatility than we've ever seen before, we endeavored to make the book work. Nobody in the bank understood how the book worked, apart from us. If we went to our managers and asked them for help with something, because we'd lost $5 million on something we didn't understand, they might say to us, well, you guys are the experts on this. You need to figure out how to make it work. And those losses might come from all sorts of complexity, which I won't go into now, but there were 4,000 moving parts in this trading book with assets in every asset class, equities, fixed income, emerging markets, the lot. And we had to learn all of it and try and manage those risks as best we could. The problem was that we were also in this great financial crisis. And so, in a world with no rules, where the imperative was not to lose money and, of course, to make profits, we generated our own set of rules. And the practices we developed ultimately were called the umbrella, developed to protect us from a rainy day, ultimately became accepted practice within the institution. And we went from losing $40 million a year in 2008, 2009, to a book that was profitable and safely run, that we understood, and that created a virtuous cycle for our institution that helped us to stem the tide of losses within the institution. It allowed us to encourage others to embrace our business. It enabled the business to grow. Our clients were able to access the business when at times they weren't. And so we felt that the systems we developed to run the book were a good thing. In 2011, we've now survived four years without a senior manager, and we've become senior ourselves. The bank decided that it was time for us to spread our wings, to generate more profit for the bank, to take more risk. We'd hired in a senior, uh, the CEO from out of retirement from Credit Suisse, Ozzy Grubel, and the economist uh, called his strategy for growth the gambling for redemption strategy because he was asking us to take more risk. Risk is what we embraced. We started taking more and more risk, and by June of 2011, we generated $130 million of profits for the bank globally, on our little desk with four people. The problem was that that was not enough. And the bank wanted us to take more risk and deliver more profits. But we were tired. We'd been working 20-hour days through the night, many days, and uh, it was actually a lot of pressure. And I remember sending a message to my supervisor saying, we were on a conference call when they asked us to increase our profit target by another 50% for that year. And I remember being on the, the chat to my colleague saying, this is ridiculous, even more pressure. And he said, don't worry, we'll be okay. The problem was that we'd become proprietary traders for the bank. We'd gone from being focused on client trading to generating profits to further the goals of the institution. Now, to do that, you ultimately have to make a call on where the market's going to go. We had a big fight that went on for two months on the back of the Japanese earthquake, the Eurozone debt crisis, the downgrade of U.S. debt. All happened in the first half of 2011. And there was a small group of us that said that the market was going to fall and a larger group, much more influential group, that said the market was going to rise. At the same time, our research department had generated a client report, research note, saying that the market was going to rise. And the reason they'd done that was because in order for the bank to generate more profits, you need a stable rising market to encourage your clients to engage in trading activity. The problem was I was making a lot of noise, telling our clients that I disagreed with this position. And I came under a lot of pressure from some very senior people in the bank who asked me to stop making that noise 
and to understand that, you know, the house view was that the market was going to rally. Now, we were also trading on the back of our understanding, right? We'd been trading, running short positions to make money. Now, I was being told that the short position we were running would lose money. Okay. So on July the 1st, 2011, with $130 million of profit in the bank, we flipped our positions from short to long. A lot of these positions were off book. The risk was not visible to everyone. It was visible to those people who mattered, but not to everyone. And we'll come to that in a moment. But on July the 1st, we flipped the positions. I wrote a note saying, well, if everyone thinks I must, if everyone thinks I'm wrong, then I must be. I'm hanging up my gloves and I'm going to go along, along with everyone else. Unfortunately, that was the very day that the market started selling off. And in the next six weeks, the market sold off some markets, more than 30%, and we rode the sell-off all the way down. And the Monday after the London riots, we came to work. I mean, I think some of you guys must have been about 16 years old then. Um, London was on fire. The markets opened down 10%, and we were down $3 billion. And uh, I said to John, dude, we need to go outside. <laughs> so we went outside and we had a conversation about what to do because we were down $3 billion. Some people knew about it, some people didn't. And we needed to find a way to recoup those losses. So we decided that we would try and find a way and we would continue to trade. But the first thing to do was to shut down the position. So we shut them down, we continued to trade and recouped between then and the 14th of September, $700 million. But by then, very senior people were starting to ask questions, some completely outside of our bubble that we'd never heard about. And emails had been going back and forth. And John, my supervisor, had sort of disappeared to the Burning Man Festival for three weeks. And the emails were coming to me, and I was trying to buy more time, so I sent a bunch of emails to try and buy that time to cover the reality of, the, of where we were from everyone. Not from everyone, from some people. And John had come back from holiday and we had a conversation and the conversation was, right, what are we going to do? And we had three options. The first two were, we all go forward and say we've lost this money and we need to resolve it. Um, the second option was we need to find a way to buy more time so we can soften the blow even more. And the third option, which came after a long discussion, trust me, was, okay, fine. If nobody wants to do, if nobody wants to go forward together, I don't think we can buy more time because I'm tired and my partner is not happy with me, <laughs> not sleeping. Um, so what if I just go forward on my own, send an email, take responsibility, I'll get fired, you guys can continue to try and do this difficult task for the bank. I mean, that's how important we thought things were and how important we thought central to the bank's goals. So I sent an email taking responsibility for the losses and the rest, as they say, is history. What has ensued is five years of legal hell. Right? Went through a trial, was charged with six things, got found not guilty of four of them because the jury realized that I wasn't acting in pursuit of personal gain. But nevertheless, I was sentenced to seven years in prison, served three and a half, was released, but now I'm fighting against being deported from the United Kingdom because I don't have a British passport. I've lived here for 25 years. Now, the reason I'm here is not just to tell you that story, because the story is important. It helps you to understand this growing complexity. What happened was partly because of excess pressure, partly because senior management didn't really understand the risks that we faced, partly because they didn't want to spend the money to buy a new manager in and pay the three or four million dollars it would have cost, partly because we were too young to realize that we weren't qualified for what we were being asked to do, partly because the bank should have had 11 or 12 traders on the book, not two or three, as our 
competitor banks did have. Partly because my character means that I try and take on problems and resolve conflict for other people. There are lots of reasons why this thing happened. So the reason I'm here to tell you the story is to help you prepare for your futures, primarily in the finance industry, but I'm also here to tell you that the risks we faced as bankers are risks, challenges that you will face whatever walk of life you go into. Why? Because in this world of increasing automation and complexity, where the word post-truth is the Oxford Dictionary word of the year, it is incredibly difficult to make ethical decisions. It's really difficult to know what is right and wrong. I learned because I found myself, I woke up walking around Wandsworth Prison, wondering, how did I get here? I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was doing what the bank wanted. You're going into a world that is a challenging place where the role of finance is increasingly being questioned. I didn't go to prison because ultimately I'm a criminal. I went to prison because of a negative outcome, because the bank lost money, and also because of a society that wanted the head of a banker on a plate. I'm not a bad person. I used to be just like you. The role of finance in our world today is one we need to focus on as I now make a comment about the future of finance in our society. Society is no longer going to accept failures in the finance industry, like we saw in 2008. And yet, in the recovery from 2008, what we've created is a situation where the risks have actually increased. where the amount of resource we use to prop up the industry has increased by $12 trillion. Where banks have paid $160 to $70 billion in fines, taking $13 trillion of balance sheet resource away from the world. As a, you know, if you do the fractional reserve accounting, $13 trillion is the amount of resource that we've lost. Now, I was at an FT conference on Wednesday, the FT Global Banking Summit. And what I saw in that conference was a group of chief executives who are incredibly somber because they understand the role that finance has played in the politics of today. The populism that has brought Brexit and Trump is in some way or other linked to the relationship between finance in our global society. Now you guys need to try and find solutions to these problems. At the moment in the industry, as you will have heard today, the solutions lie in automation, the use of things like blockchain and big data. But there's one thing that's not being answered, which is what is the purpose of the industry in our society? And since I'm here to tell you what I think the future of finance is, I think the ultimate question that you guys are going to spend your careers trying to answer is how do we ensure that the finance industry serves a purpose which benefits our global society in a positive way, not just to extract the maximum amount of value from the world, which is ultimately what the finance industry does today, but is also what the technology industry does too. Build, an, build a firm, go to an M&A, a bank, list it, grab as much profit as you can, move on to the next idea. It's all about extraction, maximum extraction. And it's destabilizing the world. And those who do not have access to that are choosing a different path. And they're forcing us to question what is the role of the finance industry in our society today? What is the role of the systems we have in place to distribute the returns of human endeavor? I heard Bill Winters, the CEO of Standard Charter, make an amazing factual point on Wednesday. He said 
that in 2001, at the time when China joined the WTO, the returns of profit from human endeavor were 60% to labor and 40% to capital. Since then, in the ensuing 15 years, the relationship has completely reversed, where 60% of profits goes to capital and 40% goes to labor. That is the very reason, I think, in my opinion, as humble as it is, that we have the disorder in our society that we see today. So, as you go forward in your careers, whether you're in finance or economics or some other field completely different, the question you have to ask yourself is what do we do to get that balance more equal? And what role does the finance industry have to play in that? We can start with thinking of a way to reduce the use of the industry to transfer value from the future to the present and suck it up into the hands of those who own the capital, which is ultimately what QE does, quantitative, quantitative easing. And stripping away from those who require social support through the use of austerity policies. Let's start there. But I don't have the answers. And I think it's going to take you guys a generation to find that. And I hope you have the energy and the drive to do that. Because we need you to. We really do. And I hope that you can take my story as an example of what happens when you lose the idealism that you start off with as young people and get caught up in the corporate machine trying to achieve a goal without being able to take a step back and think about what are we really doing? Take that opportunity when you get it as you go through your careers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think we're now going to, once the uh, lecterns disappeared around the corner, um, take a few questions from the audience. So if you could raise your hands if you have any questions. Yeah, if you could go to this lady here first. Oh, if you just like to wait for the microphone, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, Kwaku, um, for sharing your story. I just wanted to find out, do people still brand you as a criminal? Are you still perceived that way? Because you said that you were at the FT Global Banking Summit on Wednesday. So what do you feel are people's perceptions since that occurred and how have you endeavoured to change it? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I mean, all I can do is continue to try and help people look behind the headlines of what happened, um, to try and take away the lessons that are there for others. Um, as a, in, in essence a cautionary tale but also to say look you know I was sent away for a long time um, you know like being put on the naughty step you're supposed to think about what you've done and what are the lessons for others and I think that's what I've tried to do um, I think there are still people out there who've just put me in a box right you know he's a banker he's a greedy banker who just wanted to make a profit for himself that must be why he was doing what he was doing no other reason why would anyone do that it must be because he wanted more bonus. I was, did a radio interview on Thursday evening where you know, the guy from BBC Northern Ireland, just the first question he asked was, so what made you set off on this career of fraudulent trading? You know, which makes it impossible to really explain, but I have to try and explain because otherwise nobody learns. You know, the way banks deal with these type of issues is they send in, their air, airdrop in a bunch of very expensive lawyers and they put a bunker around it to try and stop people finding out exactly what happened because that's how the institution protects itself. But my job, you know, as part of the reason I pled not guilty to ensure that I could tell the story, my job is to help everyone learn from what happened but also then to say, you know what, the industry needs a form of industrial learning that it doesn't have at the moment. The only way to do that is 
to get everyone really looking at the detail of how these things happen and why. Great. Less of the self-protection and more of understanding the relationship between banking and society as a whole.